Well, good afternoon. Uh, a couple of our regulars are away. The Amelia's are under the weather, and uh, Paul and Vicky are also still up the coast. But we are continuing here uh, this week with part two of Justin Martyr. Bump down a little bit just for the reverb. Good. Yep, thank you. So, yes, this is part two of, of our uh, lesson on Justin Martyr. We covered part one a couple of weeks ago now before we went into recess. And here is, is part two. To remind you what we covered in the previous lesson in part one, we looked specifically at uh, the, the biography of Justin Martyr, the uh, second century church saint. Uh, we looked at the, the details of his life. And then we now here this week are looking at his main or well, primary well-known uh, work called The First Apology. Very similar to what we did with St. Irenaeus, where we gave the biography and then his major work against heresies. So the study notes, which you should all have before you, um, we will be going through, like we did with Against Heresies, a uh, broad, condensed synopsis of the work um, that gives you a good picture and idea of what the work was about, and then a number of the key lessons that we can learn from that particular, uh, from that particular work. Uh, on the per first page, the, the cover page, you'll have uh, that particular portrait, that particular icon of, of uh, St. Justin, the philosopher, as I explained in, in the last lesson, known as Justin Martyr or Justin the philosopher. He's the first great Christian philosopher, um, having been a philosopher throughout his life and before his conversion to Christ. Um, and he uses that academic and educational skill set that he has philosophically to then produce what is, is one of the, the greatest works of Christian philosophy and of uh, apologetics as we know it, apologetics, hence the term we'll explain as we go through, uh, in the early church. And so what we want to do is just briefly give a, a, an overview of what the, the first apology, this work that we're looking at this afternoon, is in its, in its simplest form. So Justin Martyr writes this particular work sometime between about 155 to 157 AD, in and around that time. It's addressed specifically to the Roman Emperor at the time, Antoninus Pius, uh, commonly pronounced as Antonius Pius, but Antoninus Pius, uh, who was emperor at that time uh, prior to the rise of the time of Marcus Aurelius, uh, the famous Roman Emperor um, during 160 to, roughly speaking, 160 to 180 AD. And it's given context is really to do with Justin Martyr's extensive philosophical background. Uh, due to his philosophical education coming through the various different schools that we explored in, last, in the last lesson, the, the Pythagorean school, the Stoic school, uh, the Platonic school, which is where he eventually lands uh, before his conversion to Christ, he has a great grasp and, and sees quite naturally the need to actually provide a, a valid, logically and philosophically consistent defence from the scriptures and, and from reason, God-given reason, for the Christian faith. Um, and this is why we often refer to Justin Martyr historically in theological circles as the first Christian apologist in that sense. Uh, he certainly wasn't the first in, in a literal meaning. Um, the apostles hold that, would hold that title. But in terms of the, the category or the work of Christian apologetics, which is where you are in a bit more of a formal setting, so it were, certainly at least in regards to, to writing, you are providing a systematic defense of Christian doctrine and truth, uh, working through things not just in a generic or general uh, storytelling fashion, like, like prose or narrative, um, which obviously a lot of the, the, script, the, the Gospels themselves do, but rather much more like what the epistles of Paul do and of John and of Peter, where they're not so much working through prose narrative like the Gospels are, following the story as it goes, but rather are actually providing a systematic theological exposition and flowing from one argument into the next. Does that, does that make sense? That's the work of apologetics. And it comes primarily in the, in the wording there, apology, apologia, in the Greek means to, to make a defense. Um, it's where we get the root apology. Um, we think of it as saying sorry. That's the simplistic modern semantic in English. Uh, but an apologetic in the academic term or in the Christian term uh, means to make a defense of the Christian faith. Um, and one thing which we'll hopefully see as we go through this particular work of Justin Martyr, the first apology, is that Christian apologetics should not be confined to the realm of mere academia. That's often where it finds itself, unfortunately. Um, but the real need for solid Christian apologetics for, for all Christians, be they in pulpits or in pews, 
to know the Christian faith, to know it well, uh, not just merely in an academic sense, an intellectual sense, but in truly a genuine spiritual heartfelt sense and experiential sense, is paramount to our evangelization. I've explained this plenty of times before, but when you go and evangelize and share the gospel with, say, for example, a Muslim, you will realize, if the Muslim hopefully knows what they're talking about, uh, within about the first five minutes, that they have a number of deeply rooted, systematic uh, counter-arguments to the fundamental premises of the gospel itself. And without any reasonable knowledge, A, of how to defend the gospel, but B, also, just as importantly, perhaps, uh, what Islamic doctrine is concerning those things, you're going to find yourself uh, in an approximate position of that of a kite in a hurricane. Um, because, mainly because, um, rhetorical ability is not entirely linked to whether or not the person is telling the truth. <laughs> Um, so someone can be a very skilled orator, someone can be a very charismatic rhetorician or speaker, and they can also be selling you a pack of lies. Okay. Um, the charisma with which an orator speaks or perhaps performs, depending on the setting, uh, is not the gauge of the truthfulness of the words actually coming out of their mouth. Um, and so it is entirely possible to lose an argument in a real, meaningful, genuine sense, even though you're actually on the side of truth because you've failed to defend that truth. Okay. This was a great concern for Justin Martyr, especially given his philosophical background. He knew how this worked on a, on a, well, quite frankly, on a professional level. And so that really drives his desire to provide a sound, comprehensive, biblical and philosophical defense of, the, of Christianity in totem. Um, there is the potential that he wrote this in response to Polycarp, of Smyrna's uh, execution, his martyrdom, which we covered a number of weeks ago when we were looking through the Apostolic Fathers, uh, Polycarp being the last of those as Bishop of Smyrna. He was executed, uh, he was burnt at the stake in this specific sense, uh, in this specific case. And, and the reason why we think it may have been around that is A, because of the timing. Um, Polycarp is martyred in 155 AD, um, but also by virtue of the fact that he was burnt at the stake. Justin Martyr focuses quite heavily at least proportionally speaking, on, on the justice and the wrath of God, the punishment against evil by the burning of hellfire. So there may be a kind of typological connection that he's doing so in response, and that could also explain the time framing in which it's written. But broadly speaking, uh, we, we, we're going to be coming kind of three broad categories. This is how at least I've thematically divided the first apology up for us. The first is, is and the first portion of his, of his apology here, is addressing some of the criticisms leveled against Christianity, um, both by Greco-Roman paganism and particularly by the Jews as well, um, as well as also in the mix of that, the Gnostics especially, uh, kind of like what Irenaeus was doing with his work against heresies. Uh, the second section is really dealing and diving quite deeply into Jesus Christ as the Logos, as the Word, um, this, this concept, this reality, uh, this philosophical paradigm with which, of course, Justin as a philosopher was... Uh, probably better, better acquainted with than almost anyone in the early church. Um, and then finally, the explaining, uh, the ex his explanation of the various church customs and practices tied up in particularly the addressing of certain criticisms um, leveled by those beyond or without the church. So let's address that, that first particular section, which is, in this case, Justin Martyr addressing the criticisms of Christianity. This is on page two of your study notes. In the opening chapters of, of the first apology, Justin addresses the primary criticisms leveled against Christians. And, and his particular focus is on, on three areas, three charges that were commonly leveled against the Christians, certainly during uh, the time of, in Roman history, what's called the Principate, which is up to the end of the death of Marcus Aurelius in 180, and then, which is the time frame he finds himself in. And these criticisms only further expanded during what's called the dominant, which is the time period after Marcus Aurelius, up unto the conversion of the empire, um, and then eventually the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Um, and those particular criticisms, especially in his time in the second century, well developed by that point, are the criticisms or charges against Christians of atheism, immorality, and treason against the empire. Now, naturally, there was a kind of confluence of those things. They weren't just merely in isolation. Um, they were all held with tangible links one to the other. But those three broad categories are 
what was commonly, at least on the ideological level, levelled against Christians. Charges of atheism by virtue of their denial of the Roman gods, of the state pantheon of Rome, including the uh, the divine status of the one hailed as Divi Filius, as the son of God, that is the Caesar. Um, that's the primary method of, of the charge of atheism. The immorality uh, really came not necessarily in the sense that you may immediately think of it on the surface level, but the charge of immorality was primarily about, and we'll explain as we go through, but it was primarily about not conforming to Roman moral standards. So that's the concept of immorality, and again, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit as we go through necessarily. Um, and the third is, of course, treason against the empire, which is perhaps the uh, arch criticism of these particular three, um, by virtue of their rejection of Caesar as the ultimate authority in the world. Uh, for the kind of charge that, for example, the Jews attempted to level against the Christians in Greece, as we've been seeing in our Bible study through the book of Acts recently, um, that these men are saying that there is another king other than Caesar. Um, this is the kind of treasonous, treacherous um, peril that was being leveled at the Christians during that particular time. And so what Justin Martyr does is he argues, quite successfully I'd argue, that Christians being charged abused and executed merely because they're Christians is actually unjust. Certainly by his time and, and Polycarp living, you know, during, right during the life of Justin Martyr is the arch, uh, you know, archetypical example of this. Um, at this point, there are Christians being killed simply by presumption. That is to say, the mere charge of being a Christian was enough now, by this point certainly, to have actually warranted execution at the hands of the Roman state. Um, it had already become ingrained that the Christians are treasonous heretics, um, that they're atheists, that they are immoral, all these kinds of things we've just highlighted. Um, and so then it was just assumed from that point forward a priori, as we would say, um, that anyone with the label of Christian fits that particular mould. There's no necessary uh, prerequisite for what could even faintly be considered a, uh, a fair, open and just trial by law. Um, the jurisprudential uh, elements of Roman law were malleable <laughs> when it came to the Christians. Um, and it was just simply assumed that anyone bearing that title of Christian uh, fit that particular bill. And so the actual, the actual rule of law and, and you know, the kind of necessary jurisprudential processes of a fair and open trial that are ingrained into modern Western civilization, thanks to Christianity now, um, were not there in Roman law at this particular point. Um, they would, by the grace of God, become part of Roman law centuries later after the conversion of the emperors and of many of the Christians. Um, but he inherently explains that this is, quite frankly, unjust. And so he explains, especially with regards to the, the charge of atheism regarding the false gods, he says, and I quote, that they are atheists with regards, and we are atheists, the Christians, with regarding false gods, but not with respect to the most true God, the Father of righteousness, free from all impurity, end quote. That's from chapter 6 of the first apology. So we are atheists accord, uh, by, the, by measure against the false gods of Rome, but we are not atheists in our denial of the one, only, and true God. And so the charge of atheism, that there is no God, was an unjust and inaccurate one. And he explains this quite thoroughly. Um, again, this was not the problem for Rome because Rome, as we've explained previously, especially in a lot of the weeks that where we laid the groundwork and, and giving the history in the earliest, you know, four, five, six different uh, lessons that we had concerning the history of Rome and the Greco-Roman culture of the first and, and second centuries and all of that groundwork, which we'd, you'd be able to go back and look at, we explained quite thoroughly that as far as Rome was concerned, they were not terribly worried about local indigenous worship of a certain god or gods or whatever the context happened to be. But as long as you incorporated within that framework, that paradigm, the worship and honouring of the Roman gods on top of that or alongside of that, and particularly and especially the honouring of the Caesar, then the rest was just details. Uh, they were not concerned with what you did beyond that as long as you had that element. And so the rejection of that element was, was the, the crux of the argument and the problem that drew the wrath of Rome in this particular instance. Um, but he very clearly explains quite logically, no, we're not actually atheists, and to call us such is slander. Uh, it's a lie. It's a falsehood. 
um, and it's not true and it's not defendable. Um, this kind of point, and this is something which will come up as he makes these kinds of defences. Unfortunately, we take uh, you know, examples of Christ in the Gospels, for example, where we see uh, you know, important biblical pieces of wisdom like turning the other cheek, which is correct and which is, has, has a deep root in the Old Testament. And we pair that together with the quite noticeable silence of Christ, for example, generally speaking, in Mass during his trial, um, especially in the face of Pilate. It's not literal silence because he does make he does uh, reply to certain comments that Pilate makes, um, and he's overwhelmingly silent in front of the Sanhedrin up to a point where he very clearly states that he is God in the flesh and he is the Christ. And we take that and kind of presume that that's meant to be the standard or the norm as opposed to the fact that in reality it served a given purpose. It's what we've, our Bible study students are familiar with this, but it's the distinction biblically between what's called normative and narrative. Okay. So something is narrative that happens in the story. A very obvious example of the miracles of Christ. So Christ walking on water is a narrative element. Okay. It's, in other words, it's, it's part of the story. It's part of the details of Christ's life. It should not be confused for normative because if you go out to Wentworth Falls Lake and try to perform the same thing, you're going to get very wet. <laughs> okay. Because it's not designed to be normative, it is, in fact, narrative. It's part of the narrative, but it's not normative. Um, no one should try and replicate what happened with my namesake, Daniel, and no one should think that it's going to work out well if you decide to go down and throw yourself into the lion enclosure at the zoo. <laughs> okay? Narrative versus normative. Christ's relative silence, because again, it wasn't totally silent, but Christ's relative comparative silence was because his unjust charge and unjust arrest and unjust murder was all part of the plan, right? As, as Christ said, one of, the, one of the few things he did say to Pilate was that, that if my kingdom was of this world, meaning if it, or, if it originated, obviously it's in the world, but if it originated from the world like Rome does, then I would call 10,000 of my soldiers here right now, <laughs> right? I'm paraphrasing. Um, so he speaks and he replies and he makes a defense in that particular sense, but en masse he is silent because he needed this to unfold in this particular way. That should not be taken as normative. So turning the other cheek does not inherently entail never making a defense of the truth. Turning the other cheek is primarily a piece of ancient Near Eastern wisdom which was very familiar to them. That's why they understood immediately what he meant regarding vengeance or revenge in the face of a personal insult. Right? Turning the other cheek is regarding the physical action of slapping another man, right? a deeply insulting gesture, of course, um, and not returning it with a slap in response out of your own pride or ego. It does not mean you don't make a defence for the truth, and this is sometimes something that can get lost a bit. The defence of the truth is important because really it is a defence of God, who is truth. And so he continues on. In doing so, Justin argues for separating the Christian name from given individuals who happen to have committed legitimate crimes. And this is something, by the way, that Christian uh, ministers, Christian bishops make throughout, well, the history of the church, including in the early church itself. Um, Christians, those who are Christians, and even so, even legitimately Christians, right, not just merely Christian in name, but really they fall away later or their heart's not there or whatever we happen to categorise it as, but genuine Christians, who for one reason or another actually do commit a crime, they should face justice at the hands of those to whom God has given the sword, right? Those who are to, in this world, the governing authority for the execution of justice. That is a rightful authority and power of the governing authority, right? Of the king. To execute justice, this is what Romans 13 talks about. Um, this is the rightful context. It's not a carte blanche, but according to the standards of good and evil that God defines, not the governors, but God they are to then act as his diakonos, his servant or his ministers, in wielding the sword of justice. Okay? And Justin concedes that. Right? A Christian who has committed theft or he's assaulted someone or whatever happens to be, whatever particular scale, should face justice. That doesn't mean that all Christians now just get to be declared as immoral, as if one represents the whole, because life is much more complex than that. And that kind of... To use, it, to use this word in its genuine biblical 
and dictionary definition, bigotry, <laughs> that's the appropriate context of bigotry, judging an entire group for the actions of one particular person. Um, it assumes that all those people are the same, and it assumes a sense of collective responsibility which philosophically and theologically is not warranted. The individual is responsible. And so he, he argues for separating the Christian name from a given individual who may have actually committed a legitimate crime. And he systematically demonstrates that such charges of atheism particularly are false uh, based on the Roman, sorry, pardon me, are based on false Roman traditions and doctrines derived from demons. Right, that's kind of what I hinted at earlier. We are not, and that's what we saw the quotation from chapter six, uh, we, we are only atheists in regards to the false gods of Rome, not the true God. Okay? So the charge of atheism was false. And that such a charge could only be leveled, as far as he was concerned, based on a false Roman tradition and doctrine, which he calls the doctrine of demons, because that's exactly what the apostles call it, that is not actually derived from reasonable truth or from a logical analysis of the facts. Okay? We're not actually atheists because we clearly worship God. We reject your false gods as being worthy of divine worship, and instead that should only go to God. And so your charge of atheism is logically incongruous. It is, it is in fact false. false. And especially as a philosopher, <laughs> um, and as someone who's also studied philosophy academically, this is an intelligent and clever move on his part. He compares such charges to that leveled at Socrates in ancient times. What he's referring to there is Socrates, the, the, the great 5th century Greek uh, philosopher, Athenian philosopher. He is rather contrarian even in his own day. Um, his belief in the Greek gods is uh, flimsy at best and he really doesn't see them as actually being worthy of being worshipped. Um, he lays a lot of the foundation that then gets picked up by Plato, which then gets built by his student Plato, and then gets further developed, most notably, by Plato's student Aristotle, who encapsulates this kind of stream of ideas that have come down from Socrates to Plato, now to him in Aristotle, which we call in philosophy uh, the prime mover or the unmoved mover. Um, this was Aristotle's quite profound work um, in which he works through logically and realises that there must be an eternal creative element or force which brought all things into creation. Um, he uses the analogy particularly of an apple tree. So the tree produces an apple which falls to the ground. Certain percentage of those seeds will then grow into an apple tree which produces trees which fall to the ground. Right? Da, 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 da. And he looks at the cyclical nature of the world, that this cycle cannot simply go back on and on and on and on. There must have been the first apple seed that began it all. Okay. Um, there can't just be an infinite regression because it's almost like in our modern day the kind of idiom in English, what came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> um, it's very much the kind of ancient Greek equivalent of that. Um, and he determined a number of characteristics philosophically just from a logical standpoint um, that this unmoved mover or this prime mover, in other words the first mover, the first creator, uh, must be eternal check. Um, that is to say, he can't have anyone before him that created him, otherwise he'd just be part of the cycle of apple trees. Um, he must be eternal, so he must be separate from time itself, because time had to have a beginning also. And he goes on and on and on. Socrates had a, uh, didn't have a well-developed understanding of that. That comes later with Aristotle. But a lot of the groundwork was there in the work of Socrates. And Socrates was charged in Athens in the late 5th century, the late 400s BC, on charges of atheism, <laughs> um, on charges of, well, atheism and particularly the main charge that came down from the Athenian ecclesia, or the, the assembly of the 500, was uh, corrupting the youth, <laughs> was the charge, uh, corrupting the youth, particularly with what they were viewing at the time as, an athe as atheism. Um, they then consign him to the death penalty, and it was customary in ancient Athens, certainly during the classical age at this particular time um, of Greece, the golden age of Athens, for wealthy and powerful people who were condemned to death to instead escape in the middle of the night and go into basically exile for 10 years um, because the gate may or may not have been conveniently left open. <laughs> um, this was a common thing. And so a lot of people were probably actually expecting Socrates to do what other well-known uh, well famous people in Athens had done before, which was escape. Um, and to go into exile in 10 years and then maybe return later. And he instead 
actually doubles down and calls their bluff and instead actually drinks the hemlock that he <laughs> that they give him to drink just to make a point. Um, and so he's really referring back to this well-known event in Greco-Roman culture, the death of Socrates, um, on charges of atheism and of immorality, right, corrupting the youth, um, similar to what Christians were now being charged with. And so he gives this, this contextually relevant example. And so it's through this process that he addresses these criticisms, particularly in his work of atheism, immorality, and treason against the empire, which he successfully dispels in, in quite considerable detail, especially regarding, as we saw from chapter 6, that quotation with regards to atheism. So moving on to the second section, his, his apology on Christ as the Logos, an extremely vital and important um, subject concerning our Christology, that is to say the person and work of Christ, the nature and the purpose of Jesus. Um, here he goes into, into quite fascinating detail regarding this subject. So the end of page two there of your study notes. Justin goes to considerable lengths to demonstrate that Christianity is in fact philosophically rational, that it is, to use that literal word, logical. Of course, we get the word logical or logic from the Greek word logos, um, word or, or logos. Um, thought, it also has broader semantic applications, but the word for logos is what derives our understanding of the word logic. That's why, for example, in certain creeds of the early church, particularly the Athanasian creed, um, coming out of mainly the, the, the end of the 4th into the early 5th century, um, as well as the Chalcedonian Creed coming from the Council of Chalcedon in 351, speaks, both of those speak of Christ being of a rational or a logical soul and body. So a logical soul, meaning the logos, that's what that's speaking towards. And so he defends this, <coughs> pardon me, uh, he defends that, that, that Christianity is indeed philosophically logical or, or rational. It's consistent as opposed to the systems of man, the, the, the doctrines of demons which you referred to earlier, which are in fact not. And so he shows that Christianity provides sound moral teachings for its adherents that are consistent and that the histories, ethics and virtues contained in the scriptures share some commonalities with even the famous pagan stories uh, that many of them would have been familiar with. And the reason why he does this, the reason why he spends some time, at least in this earlier portion of, of the middle section here in, in the first apology, doing so, and by that I mean referring or comparing the scriptural stories to the pagan legends and stories, is because he's showing and trying to show, and he does so successfully, showing that truth is actually objective and that the truth of reality, the truth of the world in which we live, can't even be ultimately escaped by the pagan systems. Um, the, many of the Greek heroes, uh, those of Heracles, known better by his Latin name Hercules, uh, those of Achilles, uh, the famous hero of the Trojan War in the Iliad by Homer from the 8th century, uh, Theseus, Perseus, so on and so forth, all of them had these inherent heroic qualities which you also find in the great biblical figures, Abraham, Moses, particularly warriors like King David. Uh, you find them also in Christ as well and the, the apostles as well in their own right. And the reason why this is the case is because, not because they're derived from one another, but rather because truth is actually objective because God is objective. You are naturally therefore going to find that truth permeates the world that God created by virtue of it being created by this very God. Uh, a modern analogy would be the fact, and I know this is overly simplistic, but it, for the point, both the Christian and the atheist can independently, without any knowledge of each other and their work, arrive at the exact same conclusion that two plus two does in fact equal four. Okay? The reason why is not because atheism is true, but rather because, in this case actually, Christianity is true and that God is objective, that this one eternal creator God made all things, brought all things into existence, and he ordered the world a given and particular way by which any and all people can actually arrive at the truth. Now that's not to say, for, for anyone who may be uh, thinking otherwise, that's not to say that that is because there are multiple paths to the same truth. No, there's only one truth. Um, there's only one path to the truth. But all peoples can actually arrive at the path to truth because it's objective. It's actually the very argument against the kind of wishy-washy, modern, pluralistic 
you know, all part, multiple paths lead to God and that really, you know, the Christian and the Muslim and the Hindu and the Jew and the atheist can all kind of just walk hand in hand and sing Kumbaya and all arrive at the great cosmic truth, which is, well, no one can really define. Um, no, it's not true at all. There's only one path to the truth. Uh, Christ himself says, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, he is both the path and the end of the path. He's also the gate of the path, all those who come through me. Right? So he's both the gate, the path, and the end of the path itself. Um, but nevertheless, you find, and this is what Justin points out, these commonalities in the virtues and even some of the elements of the stories because there is actually an objective truth. One other such way, not that Justin points to this himself, but one other way that we might see this is, the, is that one of the most convincing uh, arguments, one might say, for the reality of a flood in the ancient world is the fact that basically ubiquitously or universally across every major ancient culture, um, across the world, across continents, for peoples that had no interaction, and we know had no interaction in the times in which those stories were written, all have flood narratives. The Mesopotamian cultures uh, have flood narratives, the Egyptian, the Akkadian, uh, the Persian, all the way through the Indus Valley civilization, right, so the ancestors of the Indians, for example, uh, all the way across to China, North America, South America, Mesoamerica, or they say Middle America, um, all have these accounts. Europe has them. This is particularly in the, the Germanic uh, retelling of what of an event called Ragnarok, uh, where there's this great flood caused by Jormungandr, the great sea serpent or the world serpent. All these kinds of things across cultures. That's one of the most prevailing points of evidence that this in fact did happen, is the fact that, well, to put it simply, everyone says so. <laughs> Biblical and otherwise. Um, and even down to the detailing that, for example, in the Chinese uh, mythological retelling of this story, um, there are some oddly specific details. There are plenty of things that diverge from the biblical story, but one of the key fundamentals of the story that is actually identical to the biblical story is that there were eight people led by a man on a boat during a flood. Okay, and so that key element is present in the Chinese uh, you know, heritage or legacy of that particular story, um, even though they are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of miles away from what today we would call the Middle East. Um, and this is because this story actually did happen. <laughs> and so that's what he's kind of doing comparatively with the famous Greco-Roman stories of his day that the people in his uh, particular cultural context would be familiar with. And he explains that it, as a result of that, therefore, is irrational for pagans to persecute Christianity as some kind of like unique evil in society, um, which is essentially and fundamentally what, it, what was happening. Um, outside of the on and off Roman wars against the Germanians or the, the, Ger the ancestors of the modern day Germans, um, which was really only a military affair primarily um, and an effort of military operation and conquest, the Christians were being uniquely persecuted in the empire. And his argument is that such persecution is predicated on a false idea, a lie, a fundamentally erroneous notion that Christianity is some kind of unique evil in the empire, and he's demonstrating that it is in fact not so. And so the actual rulings and the so-called justice that Rome is imposing upon the Christians um, is actually in fact unjust. And so one of the most fundamental arguments that Justin then makes as a result is that Jesus Christ is the Logos. He himself is not merely part of the Logos. Uh, he's not a servant of the Logos. He's not, a, he's not a medium by which the Logos kind of operates through him in some kind of um, uh, you know, esoteric sense, but rather he is ontologically by nature the Logos. Um, that had been so long and so often spoke of in ancient Hellenistic culture. This is what the Apostle John goes to um, great lengths to explain in his prologue, so the first 18 verses of, of the Gospel of John chapter 1, um, which is one of the most philosophically profound writings really in all of the ancient world. It is the defining uh, work and revelation that 
A, the Logos is a person. Um, the Greeks really only understood that the Logos was a thing. They really held it in an impersonal sense. So for them, leading up into Christ during the Hellenistic period and even the classical age of Greece prior to that, um, the Logos was merely or simply an impersonal force, like electricity is an impersonal force in the modern day. It's a force, but it doesn't have personhood. It's not a logical soul. It has no mind. It can't think. It's not sentient. It doesn't turn on and off whenever it feels like it. Right? It's an impersonal force. It is not what the Logos is. Uh, it is not like the force from Star Wars either. Right? This impersonal nature. No. The great revelation of the Apostle John and then the other apostles after him, and then even down through the great philosophers of the church like Justin Martyr, is that the Logos is a person. Okay, it has, in this case he, personhood and agency. Um, the, the great revelation, and really that's, we've explained that before in church history and even in sermons when it's come up, um, as well as in our Bible studies, in fact, um, that really what this was, big picture, was God laying the groundwork through the Hellenistic or Greek culture um, for Christ to come into a Hellenistic or a Greekified, to use bad English, a Greek world, a world where Greek was the lingua franca, that is to say the common language of the world, uh, the common culture of the world was Greek or Greco-Roman broadly, um, the economy, the politics, so on and so forth, right? Decisively Greek, just as the West is, despite the modern nations that exist, the West is culturally British, okay? Um, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all descend and all hail from Britannia. Um, it's the exact same case here with the Greeks. And so that's no coincidence. God, of all people, giving some of the shadows and the types, the groundwork of the Logos in, the, in and through the Greek culture for over half a millennium by that point, um, is to lay the groundwork for the revelation of the Logos coming into the world. Um, and this is what he explains. And so he argues that Jesus is the very incarnation of the Logos because he is, in his essence, spiritually, as the divine God, he is the Logos. And so this, hence, why he is the, the Logos or the, the word made, uh, made flesh in that particular sense. And so he primarily points to the fulfilment of prophecy as demonstrating that Christ truly is as the Christians have actually been proclaiming since the beginning. And so this is the defense of the Christology, uh, the defense of the incarnate Christ, the incarnate God who is the Christ, I should say. Um, and he does so in a spectacular form when you actually go through some of those chapters in their direct uh, quotations themselves. And so Justin's argumentation alone really on this particular subject along these lines provides the first detailed Christian apologetic work for Christ as the Logos. Um, not that he's, again, not that he's the first to say that Christ is the Logos, of course that goes back to the Apostle John in, in, in his Gospel, but the first systematic, comprehensive, conclusive defense of that, keeping in mind he's writing this to the Roman Emperor, this is the first time we, we really get that. And he does so by drawing especially upon uh, this kind of robust, sophisticated philosophical grounds. It is, uh, well, it's unique, it's groundbreaking, it's revolutionary in that particular sense, not because he's reinventing the wheel, just simply because he's the first Christian that's really had the background and the education and the professional skill to be able to right on this particular level. And as you can see that he draws heavily upon his extensive philosophical training. He explains that such schools of philosophy that he's been through, and he went through multiple schools, um, landing eventually on the Platonic, um, they only give a partial truth about the Logos. They, they have the shadow of it. They have, it's hidden behind the veil kind of thing. They have it. They sort of kind of get it, but they're stumbling around in the dark, to use Paul's reference to the Athenians in Acts 17. Um, because they're only connected in part to the Logos. They're not entirely in communion with Christ because they're outside of him. Um, they ultimately remain separate from God. They're connected by virtue of the fact that they are living, breathing human beings in the world. They've been created by God. They've been given life. They've been given themselves a logical soul, a spirit. They have a mind. They have a will. But that, that image of God is shattered. That image of God is broken. It's separated from Christ. This is the curse of, of sin, of course. They need to be reconnected with God 
They need to repent and turn in faith to the Logos in order to be truly restored to God. And so there's also an evangelistic element which really is kind of weaving its way through uh, his philosophical work here and his desire that they would not ultimately remain separate but rather would actually ultimately be rejoined, be reunited with God. This is actually fascinating with the, the kind of meaningful semantic definition of the word religion. Um, religio. Re, the prefix meaning to again or to connect. And legeo or different derivations depending on what you're talking about semantically. But long story short, it means to, to connect back to the source or to connect back to God. So religio or religion is, is to reconnect with God. That is the, its historic Latin definition. Um, and so the Christian religion is perhaps the most apt term. Religion as a term is not a bad thing. Religion can be false. Um, of course, there are false religions, um, and they are false by virtue of the fact they do not reconnect you back with God. In fact, they actually only further separate you. And so the term religion actually ironically ends up becoming, well, oxymoronic. <laughs> um, and so he here highlights this important truth. And so finally... Uh, is his exposition on on church practices, um, which we'll go through here, a couple of points, and then uh, a primary quotation coming from chapter 67, which is what we'll conclude with. So herein in page three of your study notes, Justin provides one of the most comprehensive accounts of the custom and and practices of the early church. So a lot of when we want to know, okay, what were, how did Christians do this particular thing within the liturgy or within the life of the church? Justin Martyr's work here in the First Apology provides, at least by comparison, uh, quite a bit of detail. Um, As I said, comparatively speaking, compared to other documents which are focused on other things. But here it's because he's making a defence of the Christian practices. He explains in in quite comparative detail uh, the nature and the administration of the sacraments of of baptism and of the Eucharist, right, of communion, um, as well as the weekly worship of God conducted by the Christians. Now, one, one... big reason why, especially with regards to the Eucharist, with regards to communion, um, is because one such charge, which kind of fell under the banner of immorality, was that at times, this wasn't always the case, but there were certain times on and off in which the misconception among the imperial authorities, or well, Roman, <laughs> the Roman public generally, but in this case, judicially or legally, the Roman authorities, was that Christians were engaging in cannibalism. Okay? This is my body broken for you. This is my blood. Take of it and drink. Okay. Um, and again, we've explained in times before, we explained this uh, when we looked at Irenaeus, for example, as well as the Apostolic Fathers, um, as well as the view that, that again, we, we, we teach here, um, is that it, it, there is not merely a memorial nature to the communion. So in other words, it's not just simply like an Anzac Day service where we're just kind of paying mental homage back to the the event of the cross itself. Um, But in regards to what both the early church and the medieval church and the reformers um, ever since have have called the real presence of Christ, not in the way that Rome kind of twisted that, unfortunately, during the high and late medieval period. So Protestantism rejects what's called transubstantiation, which is this Aristotelian category coming from Aristotle, coming from Aristotelian philosophy that has it where the actual substance of the elements changes in the process of what would be in this case I as the minister performing the right RITE. Um, That's a whole complex definition as to what the word substance means in an an Aristotelian sense, but that's another issue. Um, But it's it's the rejection of that, but not into pure memorialism where we're just simply you know, intellectually remembering back, that, that Christ, not physically, but spiritually, is made real to us and with us, hence the term communion, uh, by the grace of God and by the working of the Spirit in and through us who are receiving the elements themselves. And so they're hearing that language, right? They're hearing the language of this is the body and blood of Christ, which it is, not because it changes substance, but because spiritually... Christ is the manna from heaven. Spiritually, we receive the grace of God through it. And we are not actually literally eating the body and blood, but again, they didn't get that. Okay? So they're hearing this is the body and this is the blood, and they're mistaking it for an act of cannibalism. Um, this is the kind of thing I'm, I'm highlighting to here. So his desire to explain what on earth these two sacraments actually are, what they are 
elementally, so in other words, with regards to their, their, their nature, what they are practically, so what their purpose is, how they function, all these kind of things, is both an explanation of the details themselves, while also really in this primary context of the document, being an explanation for the pagan to understand what on earth it is we're actually doing. What do we mean by baptism and what is it? What do we mean by the Eucharist, that, that, the Greek word eucharistos, which means, uh, eucharisto, which means to give thanks for. Right? It comes from when Christ took the cup and he gave thanks for it. That's where that word comes from. Um, it's his defense of that that helps dispel the errors and the lies of what outsiders in Rome were erroneously charging the Christians with. Okay? And so he points to the reality that such is in obedience, the practice of the sacraments and other such uh, you know, things conducted during liturgy and weekly worship, that such is in, obedi- is in obedience to Christ and in imitation of the apostles to whom the crucified and resurrected Lord actually appeared. So he points to the authority of the apostles themselves, obviously in the scriptures. These men knew Christ, they walked with Christ, they talked with Christ, they lived with Christ, they saw him die, they saw him buried, they saw him rise from the dead, and they saw him ascend and enthroned in heaven. And so he's pointing beyond just himself. This is not... uh, as Justin is highlighting, this is not just my fanciful ideas. I'm not coming up with anything here. I'm not reinventing the wheel. This is what Christians fundamentally believe. Um, and so that's why, I mean, that, that, that concept alone of, of what Justin's goal or mission is here really kind of touches at the heart of why studying church history is important in the first place. Here he is giving a defence of why we do what we do. Here's the reason for it. And so then having or remaining in ignorance of those details, remaining in ignorance of the work that, in this case, men like Justin Martyr and many, many others throughout the last 2,000 years have done, only leaves us worse off, not better. Because these are the explanations. Why is it this way? Uh, what, does, what does the Apostle Paul mean when he says da 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 What does the Apostle Peter mean when he says this? Or when the Apostle John says that, what does that mean? Well, we go back and we look at what very, very, very brilliant and intelligent men, in this case like Justin Martyr and many others, have said about the matter, it gets us outside and beyond ourselves and our little world and our little time in history and our context in it um, and allows us to see the bigger picture. And so Justin Martyr's own motive here really speaks to the, the heart of that. And so I'll, I'll leave you with this, this particular um, reading, this particular quotation that comes from chapter 67 Uh, which is towards the end of of the first apology. It's a very, very lengthy document. It's the longest one that's been written at this point. I think it even surpasses um, uh, Against Heresies by Irenaeus. I think it also uh, surpasses the epistles of both Polycarp and Ignatius. In fact, it definitely does. Um, It's a very, very detailed document that goes for chapter after chapter after chapter. 67 is near the end. I think it has roughly nearly 70 or 75 chapters in total, I think, of memory. Um, and so I'll leave you with this particular um, quotation and exhortation, really, from Justin Martyr, the philosopher. So, quote, We continually remind each other of these things, and the wealthy among us help the needy, and we always keep together, and for all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the maker of all things through his Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Ghost. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts all the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray, and as and as we said as we before said, when our prayers are ended, Bread and wine and water are brought, and the president, in like manner, offers prayers and thanksgivings according to his ability, and the people assent, saying, Amen. And there is a distribution to each, and a participation of that over which thanks has been given. And to those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons, and they who are also, so who are well to do and willing, give what each thinks fit. And what is collected is deposited with the president who succors the orphans and widows and those who, through sickness or any other cause, are in want. And those who are in bonds and the strangers sojourning among us and in a word takes care of all 
who are in need. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Saviour, on the same day, rose from the dead. For he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, so before the Saturday, in other words, Friday, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, Sunday, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things, which we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So a couple of elements here. Again, we've seen this before, but this is one of the most blatantly clear. The liturgy, right, the service, the worship, liturgos or liturgia, um, service, literally. Right, so that's why it's called a worship service or the liturgy. Right? The liturgy contains... Baptism, when, when obviously apparent or when up, up on schedule, um, it, it involves the Eucharist or Holy Communion, right? so the distribution of the bread and the wine and water. Wine and water were mixed uh, in the ancient world, well, and they still are in one sense today, but they, are, they were mixed blatantly in order to temper down the initial kind of uh, strength of the wine, and also by virtue of the fact that at the exact same time, you know, God incorporating common cultural customs and images, the water and the wine plays a very significant symbolic role in the crucifixion of Christ by virtue of the fact that when the centurion confirms Christ's death by piercing him in his side, what pours forth from the wound? Then remember? Yeah. Blood and water. <laughs> Represented in the wine, yes, correct. Right? Blood and water. The blood and the water and he who comes to me shall drink streams of living water. Right? The fact that it harkens back to the fact that Christ is the true temple of God, that he is the fulfilment of the Old Testament, that he, like that which was prophesied in Ezekiel, for example, of this water flowing forth out of the east from the temple, and Ezekiel was at his, le- at his ankle height, then his knee height, and then as he moved further forward, his weight, and then he was now swimming in the water by the time he was about two kilometres away um, from the temple, and these streams of living water filled all the earth and living trees brought forth fruit and all these kinds, this beautiful image of the kingdom of God and the gospel going forth into the world with streams of living water, fresh water, as opposed to salt water, which represented death and which we couldn't drink and represented the lack of life and, and the darkness of paganism and so on and so forth. And then, of course, the blood, which should be fairly straightforward, the pouring of the blood, the sprinkling of the blood. And in this case, now here, the centurion literally and figuratively being baptized in the blood and the water coming forth from Christ as it sprays out upon him. Um, so then naturally, when it came to communion, where you would take the wine, which was real wine, right? take the wine and mix it with water, which was already a part of the practice anyway, The image of the blood and the water, i.e. the wine and the water, was now already there, which also tied back into the biblical imagery and symbolism. And so he makes that apparent. The term that we're translating here, again, keeping in mind he's obviously writing in Greek um, and in Latin, um, but here in Greek, um, the term that we translate president literally means the one presiding over. It's not like President, capital P, of the United States of America, that kind of president. It's president in the sense of the one who presides over the minister or the bishop. Um, And so the one presiding over the Eucharist or the Holy Communion, he has words of institution, he blesses it, he gives thanks for it, right? And that's why we do that. We have that whole little ritual that we do beforehand because it's an important part of instituting what we call the words of institution. We quote the scriptures that on the night before his crucifixion, Christ took the bread and having blessed it, he broke the whole rigmarole. That's because that's been the practice all the way back. Right? And as you can see here from Justin's own words, there's an offering taken up and he explains here that particularly the wealthy among them, um, as he is able to or, or as he's fit to, gives alms, A-L-M-S, gives, gives an offering uh, that is then given to the good work of the church and particularly in caring for the widows and for the poor. And so all these elements which are part of the liturgy by design uh, are not because we here at Katuma Baptist Church thought it was a good idea. (laughs) Um, They come from the scriptures um, and they come from the historic practice of the church which testifies to the biblical practice. Um, Without, quite frankly, without 
the singing of hymns, which they which he begins with there and, and talks about. Without the singing of hymns, without uh, prayers, without the proclamation and the reading of the scriptures and the preaching of it, um, without the giving of an offering, without communion, you don't have. A, a worship service. <laughs> you don't have. You have to have these key elements. These are things which the early church clearly testified to as the consistent practice of the church. And so, getting together and maybe sort of singing some songs and then having some McDonald's <laughs> or some fast food somewhere doesn't constitute a worship service. Um, it doesn't mean the Christians can't get together and and enjoy fellowship or do these other things. That's that's all fine. But there is something distinct and special about the worship of God and the liturgy on, as he very clearly points out, Sunday. There's something very significant about that, and it is special, and it's always been special. And so that ends uh, our lesson this afternoon. Um, take those notes home, read through them again. It's a, it's a, a, a broad categorical synopsis of what is a very, very lengthy and detailed work, which usually only uh, schmucks like me in academia are the ones who plough their way through it. Um, but you can find copies, of course, very readily available online. Um, a simple internet search for Justin Martyr's first apology will actually get you access to the full document um, if you feel like going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, I encourage people to do it. Um, it's just a, it's a, it's a significant work. Um, but nonetheless, that ends us on just a matter. So, does anyone have any, uh, we'll go open to question time, and usually there's not many questions, which is good, but does anyone have any questions or any comments about the, the material from this afternoon? Very good. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um, that therein ends our lesson on part two of Justin Martyr. <laughs>